bits and pieces of information, but what we know for certain is that at some point in the early 21st century, all of mankind was united in celebration. We marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to AI. AI? You mean artificial intelligence? A singular consciousness that spawned an entire race of machines. The recurring motif of modern science fiction is somehow the machines become aware and then become our masters. I mean, that's the great anxiety of our time. That's a nice moment in The Matrix where Morpheus describes the symbiosis of the machines and the society. I don't believe it. It's not possible. And it's true already. We're already dependent on machines. The machines couldn't exist without us, and we can't exist without them. And that's already true. And it's really been true from the beginning, almost. Uh, humans rose from the muck by being tool makers. Some of my colleagues have a notion that we're going to evolve into machines, that gradually we'll take little bits and pieces of machine parts, and the machines will become more biological. And in the end, there's not going to be an us and a them problem, but we will have evolved into being more cyborg. If our information technologies are doubling in their power every year, which means they will improve by a factor of a million over the next 20 years, it's going to have a very profound impact. And the capability of machines will vastly outstrip that of, of humans. You can't help but feel like that there's that something large is looming. Like imagine a world where the machines have taken over and they're keeping the human beings in glass bidets and drawing electric power from their spines. Okay, that's an idea, but then what are the details? What would happen? And that's part of, I think, their interest that people had in, in the Matrix is playing out the idea of a totally persuasive, totally immersive virtual reality as, as something to uh, either worry about or conjure with. No amount of reasoning or observation could ever completely roll out the hypothesis that I'm in a matrix right now. I give it about a, at least a 20% chance that right now I'm in a matrix. We can make an artificial intelligence smarter than we are right now with the hardware we have, but we don't know how to hook it up. It's got to be possible in principle. We may have the wrong theory today, we may have the wrong theory tomorrow, but some way or other, what the brain is is a great, big, massive computer. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? Your clothes are different, the plugs in your arms and head are gone. Your hair has changed. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. The Matrix was such an amazing movie because it helped us realize the importance of the simulation and the difficulty of differentiating the simulated from the real. And in the end, maybe they are the same when the simulation's fidelity gets good enough. As simulations acquire more complexity, more depth, more of the kinds of things that we imagine, um, like more physical sense as well, that, that, the, that they become hyper-real in the sense that they are real themselves to some level. Well, there's a funny story. I was talking to someone who's an army scientist, and he was talking about flight training that they do down in Florida. And, you know, they had this kid in, the, in class. He aced all his written tests. They took him up in the plane, did great. Instructor says, so how long you been flying, son? Kid says, I've never flown a plane in my life. It's Microsoft Flight Simulator. And in fact, I downloaded the terrain around this training environment so that I could practice. This is a different world that we're living in. And the kicker was the instructor thought that was cheating. I mean, that's one of the ways in which video games are absolutely uh, the, the quickest way to glimpse the future, and glimpse the future in a, in a very serious way. I mean, not just, you know, oh, these terrible games, you know, the kids are wasting their time. We're actually exploring what it's like to interact with intelligent software that is posing as some kind of life form and interacting with us in a pretty rich way. And millions of kids, <laughs> not, not kids anymore so much, but millions of people 
from 10 to 40 are interacting with these artificial intelligent kind of creatures every single day. It's become a part of mainstream life, but we, we don't think of it as being that significant because it's all off in this world of games. But in fact, it's maybe the most interesting thing happening technolo technologically right now. I think how immersed people become in games depends on the genre of the game. There are certain games that are incredibly immersive for short periods of time. A first person shooter, when you're playing one, that is your existence because it's a, a visceral kind of survival thrill and there's a competition thrill because there's people you're playing against who are gonna humiliate you if they win and you're gonna humiliate them if you win. On the other side, there's massively multiplayer persistent worlds where people spend hours and get incredibly invested in their clans and their characters and the reputations they build in those worlds. The major theme of this coming decade is going to be identity of self. Every time computers get more powerful, they basically threaten our established understanding of ourselves, both in terms of who we are or who we could be. If I have my computer doing something for me, is that an extension of myself? Is there really a self there? Or is that just a, a bot? So I think the self is, is really going to undergo some transformation or expansion in the coming decade. And we see that with like online games where the identity that people have with these personas and avatars is very intense in the sense of this being real, a place that they come to for many hours a day, maybe realer in a certain sense in its consequences than the other world that they leave. It's very, 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 very powerful evidence that our notions of self are under transition right now. Well, the idea with there was to connect the socializing that people did online with their friends with the environments like a video game, but not to force them to play a video game in order to be in those environments. So in there, you'll enter and you'll see lots of other people and they'll be talking. You'll walk up to somebody and strike up a conversation. If this is your first time, you'll undoubtedly say something like, hey, I'm new here, what's cool? What should I see? Or how do I use this? Or what's that crazy boat flying in the sky? And the person will respond. And they'll usually do something like offer to give you a ride or to take you someplace cool. One of the key parts of our software is you can build new stuff in the world. You can build a table, you can build a gun, you can write a script for the gun that gives it behavior, shooting bullets or shooting flowers. So initially we thought, well, we're gonna have to create a lot of content so that people will wanna come and then maybe we'll make the first gun and then our users will make sort of knockoff guns. And that stopped being true about one week after we went live. At that point, our users discovered this flexibility and they started building all kinds of wacky stuff that we had never imagined was even possible with our system. It's not just communicating in a graphical world. It's not just shared experience. When you get people being able to have roles in a virtual world, then part of their lives actually gets spent meaningfully in the virtual world. And at that point, I think people can spend a great deal of their time online. 60 million polygons a second is reality. When your uh, simulation systems get that good, you look down and you say, well, I can, I can see the pixels if I get way down, but humans don't go that far down. Graphics processors in the last 10 years have been increasing actually faster than Moore's law in the realism and number of polygons that they're able to render. So that means that if you project forward even just a couple more years, graphical realism that's going to be possible on personal computers is really tremendous and much greater than what's out right now. The human mind is actually, has a propensity, a, a natural gift to move into other realities. When you're reading a book, a novel, when you're totally engrossed in a story, particularly one that's not visual that you're imagining in your own mind, you're creating a kind of a version, a virtual reality. Typically, we think we are where we have control over our sensory systems. So, you know, I can move my eyes around and I think I am wherever that can be done. So telepresence, all the new technologies of telepresence rely on this. You know, give me a nice closed loop link to a camera on top of a building so that I can, as I move my head, that camera moves around and I'll begin to feel as if I'm on top of the building because you've closed the loop. You've closed the loop between motor control and sensory input coming from the world. Uh, wherever you've got a closed loop, I think you've got a, an embodied, present person. The real promise of virtual reality is really to do it from within our nervous system. And that's really the, what happens in the matrix. By the late 2020s, we'll have billions of nanobots, little blood cell-sized robots, with 
It's very significant computational and communication abilities in our bloodstream, providing full immersion virtual reality from within the nervous system. So if you want to go in virtual reality, the nanobots shut down the signals coming from your real senses, your real skin, your real eyes, and replace them with the signals that you would be receiving if you were in the virtual environment. And then your brain feels like it's in that virtual environment. And these can be fully realistic, not cartoon-like, but totally compelling, highly detailed recreations of either earthly environments or fantastic environments that don't exist on Earth, but you will feel like you're in them. When you go to move your muscles, the nanobots will, again, not move your real muscles, but they'll move your virtual limbs. And so you'll feel like you're moving around in that virtual environment. And then you can go there by yourself, or you can go there with some other person or other people and have any kind of experience from sensual and sexual encounters to business negotiations to any kind of interaction in these virtual environments. The design of the environment itself will be a new art form. Some will be fantastic earthly environments. Some will be a very imaginary environments that don't exist on Earth or couldn't. The real goal, of course, is not to replicate exactly what we have, but to make it different. That would be the fun part, is to say, well, what if we didn't have gravity? What if we had the world exactly the same, but or if there was no friction, or maybe what if light bent around corners? And that would be the real fun, was actually having alternative worlds in this reality. Creating something like the metaverse in the language of Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, or something like The Matrix, is, is possible. This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. So you might think this idea that we could be in a matrix right now is just, you know, it's a movie or it's science fiction, science fiction speculation and so on, fun to think about, but no reason to believe it's real. Well, I don't know, some people have suggested that maybe this is a hypothesis that we ought to take with some seriousness. and. I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, simulation technology, it's already pretty good. You know, they started off way back with SimCity, simulating a city, simulating people, maybe there's Sim Earth out there somewhere too. Well, you can see how 100, 200 years time, we're gonna have simulated universes running on every teenager's desktop computer. Each of these simulated universes is going to simulate particle by particle, everything going on in the universe, people like you and me, thinking with brains and so on, then you start to think, okay, so if there are a billion simulated universes being run on computers, then there are going to be billions and billions of billions of billions of simulated people in the world. Maybe just four or five billion unsimulated people in the world. I start to say, well, what are the odds that I'm one of the lucky ones? Thinking about the probabilities, I ought to expect that it's more likely that I'm one of the simulated people. I ought to expect that right now I'm in a matrix because there are billions of matrix worlds, just one real world. Stop! Let me out! Let me out! I want out! As we try to build a mechanical intelligence, for me, I see it as an internal quest. It's really an effort to understand ourselves. The human brain is the most elaborate object we know of in the universe. You know, it's far more elaborate than any star or nebula or quasar in terms of its complexity and its levels of emergence. Um, so I think it's kind of natural that we're always going to be striving to more fully understand that system. And models, you know, the way I see models, are as a, a tool of understanding. You know, much like a telescope, you know, extends my eyesight, um, or a car extends my legs, you know, computer models extend my imagination. I'm able to make my imagination 10 times more powerful by using a computer model to uh, enhance it and amplify it. And so I see these models as kind of attempts for us to understand ourselves you know, by modeling ourselves. There is a notion that we can simulate uh, a, lot of, we, a lot of reality, but simulation only takes you so far because the world is uh, really so crafty and gnarly. The concrete world is just a very messy, noisy place with lots of stuff going on. And evolution and life depend on that. They depend on exploiting all that, all the dust and noise and shadows and crosstalk that's in the real concrete world is the very food of evolution. And when you go virtual, when you go into an artificial simulated world, you go into a very quiet world where nothing happens unless you say it happens. And 
you don't have all of the built-in side effects. One of the biggest benefits we get from models in science is the fact that models are extremely good at illuminating our ignorance. Um, you know, scientists will come up with a theory of something and they'll build a model of a system. And then they'll compare the model to reality and they'll find out, hey, our model is not, you know, predicting reality. Why is that? And they'll usually uncover that there's some aspect of reality that they don't understand or that they're totally missing. And so the models are really the most useful, you know, in science right now for illuminating those parts of the system that we don't understand. Simulators are very valuable if you have a very bounded domain that they're simulating. You have to have the rules that they choose to simulate very clear. If, you, uh, if they aren't clear, it breaks into mush almost immediately. I think in a computer simulation, you can certainly achieve a very high level of complexity. But whether or not we'll want to call that intelligent or not is a different question, because I think what we think of as intelligent is being human to some extent. And so for a simulation to really feel intelligent will be a challenge. It'll be really good at doing a lot of things that people can't even do, you know, whether it's playing chess or solving problems of many kinds. But I still think to really feel intelligent it has to be more human. Well, it's a very old uh, issue. I mean, it goes back to the 18th century, la machine, the idea that we are machines. And of course, if by machine you mean a physical system capable of performing certain functions, then we are machines. If you think of how the brain works as a physical system, well, it seems to me the brain is a type of machinery. And that means if we understood how it worked, we ought to be able to build a duplicate brain. We ought to be able to build something that would do the same thing, that would also cause consciousness. It all goes back to Descartes, I think, in a way. He's the one who really introduced the mind into science. The way he did it was, in some ways, just backwards. Descartes' view was a dualism, a mind-body dualism. You have mind and the brain, and they're two totally different things that somehow, in some mysterious way, interact. Now, for a number of reasons, that's incoherent. Nobody ever gave an account of how the mental could cause anything physical or, or how anything physical could cause anything mental. But we know it happens, right? We know I decide to raise my arm and the damn thing goes up. I mean, there isn't any doubt. People call that dualism of mind and body. There's two things, the mind and the body. And again, this is an idea which was very popular a few hundred years ago. These days, more controversial. In René Descartes' view, back in the 16th century, the physical world was like a clockwork mechanism. He was, of course, a materialist and a mechanist about everything except the human mind. And he strangely flinched when it came to consciousness. He was quite sure that animals, uh, sheep, say, is basically just a mechanism, a very, very complicated mechanism. He thought the one thing that it couldn't do was really what, what I'm doing right now, and that is have a conversation. He thought human, human conversation, human minds were beyond the realm of the mechanical and the material. So Isaac Newton focused exclusively on the physical world. The brilliant idea he hit upon is all you need are equations. If you have an equation describing gravitation, that's all you need. You don't need to know why the apple falls, only at what rate of acceleration it falls. And the whole edifice of modern science is built upon that fundamental Newtonian ideology, which is don't ask awkward questions about why things are, or what ultimately drives the world, or what the world ultimately is. Just write down the equations. And that gave birth to behaviorism, which was basically the attempt to treat animals and humans as kind of stimulus response devices. And there was nothing in the middle that would control behavior. It was just something came in, something went out, and there was some sort of curious mapping between the two. And that sort of approach really was dominant for, I don't know, 80 years or something. But then, bang, along comes the digital computer as a sort of general purpose tool for experimentation in the late 50s and early 60s. And cognitive science just came out of people saying, hey, look, we now finally have a tool which is going to allow us to investigate that thing in the middle. In 1950, Alan Turing claimed that a digital computer suitably programmed could adequately simulate the linguistic output of a typical human being. And Turing famously claimed that in the event of adequate simulation of a human being's linguistic output by a digital computer suitably programmed, 
The only reasonable thing to say is that that computer is intelligent. Turing provided the uh, logical foundations for computer science, established what is a computation and what computations could and could not do. The potential of this as a parallel world, as a way to, one, reflect life, but two, maybe even to make another kind of life, was obvious from the very beginning. And that researchers' heads began to fill with all kinds of imaginings about what would happen if these things became more powerful. People had always wanted some tangible way to talk about and to investigate, to explore the mind and the brain. And since the year dot, it just had not been possible. You know, the best you could do was sit around and, and chin wag. Some of the early advances in AI, like uh, Simon and Newell's general problem solver and some of the early chess programs. They were able to make much more progress on some human cognitive problems, things that people said, well, geez, if you could beat a chess master with a computer, you've got intelligence, right? I mean, because it takes an intelligent person to play chess. So some of the early problems that AI tackled, they had quite surprising success with until it was sort of discovered that you know, that these were the easy problems. And so yes, a computer can play chess, but no, a computer can't tell the pawn from the king. You know, that's the hard problem. That's what they didn't realize. If you learn to recognize one chess set, you give him like some Marcel Duchamp chess set, where everybody else can tell what the pieces are, he can't tell, you know? So the, the hard things are the things that we take for granted. The oracle in the matrix is presumably a neural network. Bingo. Not quite what you were expecting, right? Because she's a program that uh, is intuitive rather than mechanistic like the rest of, of these, these programs. But neural networks can do a lot of stuff. They can pour through huge databases, but they still can't tell Osama bin Laden from a bagel. Similarly, if you want a robot to clean up your house, you have great difficulty writing a program line by line to tell the robot how to do it because there's so many contingencies and unexpected situations that you really can't write a program line by line to do that. On the other hand, if you look at the natural world, nature deals with perpetual novelty and constant uncertainty and contingencies all the time and does a very good job of that. That's actually the key to human intelligence. We're not very good, actually, at logical, analytical thinking. Computers are already much better than us at considering the logical implications of many different factors. We are very good at recognizing certain types of patterns, a face, speech sounds. The machines have not matched that yet. Machines are getting better and better. Ultimately, when machines do match human pattern recognition, they can combine it with other ways in which machines are greatly superior to people. Machines can remember billions of things accurately, they can do logical analyses at extremely high speed. They can share their knowledge instantly, whereas we can only share our knowledge at the slow speed of language. So the combination of the inherent advantages of machines with the deep powers of pattern recognition that human intelligence represents will be a very formidable combination. Turing also anticipated the notion of evolutionary computation and speculated that artificial intelligence could be achieved through a genetic or evolutionary search, as he called it. And by that he meant that there would be uh, some progressive process where uh, combinations of attributes, or what he called combination of genes, would get together and the system would be evaluated in terms of uh, how well it did at solving the problems. And it was amazing the progress he made in his lifetime, you know, which is back in the 40s and 50s, um, the insights he had into the idea of, you know, what would self-replicating code look like? What could you do with that? Um, <clears throat> he took a lot of, you know, inspiration from biology, which, you know, has become recently more trendy in computer science, but he was doing this, you know, 50 some odd years ago. Most of the things that we've manufactured till now have been very simple. But with the advent of computers and, and, manu and other processes, we actually could make things that, that were as complicated as things that we found in nature. And that, in fact, to make things more complicated than we make them right now, we have to use the principles of nature to even make them or govern them. If I could give a prize for the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin, ahead of Einstein, ahead of Newton, uh, the single best idea anybody ever had, the idea of natural selection. And the reason I think it's so important and so wonderful is that it really does unite 
the world of meaning and purpose on the one hand with the world of mechanism and matter on the other. In traditional Darwinian evolution, the fittest individuals and species survive and they grow and prosper and they mate and they produce new species and new individuals, but there's no particular predetermined end goal to the process. Whatever survives and works well in the environment uh, survives and works well. Everything that means anything in the world owes its existence to that process. So it's the great unifying idea. If you accept the idea that mechanical systems can share a lot of the attributes of, of a biological system as they become more complicated, then the question that I begin to ask is what are some of the properties that these very complicated mechanical systems have that they share with biological systems like a beehive or a rainforest? And one of the key ideas is that they share this phenomena called emergence, meaning that certain behaviors that the system itself exhibits are not found in any of the parts of the system itself. That from very simple local processes and local interaction rules, you can get quite complex uh, global phenomena. That's what emergence is, is when you have lots of little dumb things somehow create a single, larger, smart thing. Even if you understand the parts completely, you put them together in each other's presence, the system behaves entirely differently than you would have supposed if you superposed your understanding of the parts, said this is how it's going to behave, the system does something totally different. And so our own brains are the best example of emergence. The individual neuron is very dumb, isn't very smart, doesn't know very much. You wire them all together and out of that emerges these thoughts that we're having, an ability to think very deep things that no neuron itself can contain. And we see that phenomena again and again throughout the natural and mechanical world. Well, the question of emergence in an ant colony is how is it possible that a lot of fairly stupid ants together can do the amazing things that colonies do? There are maybe 10,000 species of ants on the planet. They're incredibly successful. There are ants everywhere. They are extremely good at allocating tasks and making sure that ants are doing the right thing at the right time. They're finding food sources, waging war, building complex structures. But no individual ant is in control of the colony. So you can think of the behavior of ant colonies as emerging somehow from the behavior of individuals. One of the general themes we see when we look at mechanical systems and biological systems and try and understand how they govern themselves is that all the successful systems that we know about, whether it's a rainforest or a living cell or the internet, have what we call a bottom-up governance meaning that there is no central control over the entire thing, no central brain, no central command that's governing things. An, an example of central command would be the old Soviet Union, where they were trying to have an economy that was dictated by a polybureau that decided what the price of soap would be or how many soaps would be made. The only kinds of communication that complex systems do with others is two-way communication that allows feedback. You don't send out the one-way communication because it reduces complexity. And if you look in human social systems, there's all kinds of examples of one-way communication that screw up the civilization royally. Well, a feedback loop is basically you send a message and you get a response back. It's everything from this thing costs $10 and people don't buy it. Well, that means it's too expensive. In Russia, if people didn't buy something, they just keep producing it. At the same time, if somebody paid $20 for it, they wouldn't produce more. So there were no feedback loops. And what's interesting is that there was a feeling that the experts should control things because the experts know. But in fact, what we find out is that you don't need experts to control things. Dumb people, citizens, who are not as smart in politics, say, as a professional, can actually govern things better than experts can if, and this is crucial, all the lower rungs, the bottom, is connected together. And so the real change that's happened is that we're bringing technology to, to connect lots of dumb things together. And that allows this bottom-up governance to happen. Artificial intelligence had a phase where at MIT people talked about symbolic AI, about AI that was built out of rules. 
And then there was a tremendous movement within the artificial intelligence community to talk about a more neural and biological notions of how AI would be built really from the bottom up, that the rules would emerge and artificial intelligence would emerge, and perhaps even consciousness would emerge from the interaction of agents, from the interaction of, of, a, of, a, of a distributed system where there was no kind of leader, no ego uh, intelligence. eBay decided to do the same thing with its trust networks, basically, where it had this problem of all these people doing these auctions to other people, and there were no kind of authorities in that mix. So you could either take a kind of a top-down approach and say, I'm going to run a credit check on every single person who does business on this site, or I'm just going to let all the different agents kind of rate each other and make those ratings visible to everybody else. And so let the community kind of regulate itself rather than have some authority come in and watch over and you know, and survey the entire kind of situation and, and arrest people or promote people based on what they see. Anything that we make that's sufficiently interesting to us is going to require us to allow it to have a certain autonomy. So in order to make a systems work that, that seem very humane and actually fit us, they have to have a certain amount of adaptability and flexibility. And in order to give a system that's really complicated and internally self-sufficient to stand on its own, the only way we could do that is by surrendering some control to it. People can have the essence of evolution, which is things going out there and being tried and having feedback such that feedback has effect on what was put out there. That feedback loop is absolutely critical. By having these open systems and have, um, also having rapid copying uh, happen, we see good ideas spread very far and faster, at least popular ideas. Search engines reinforce what's popular on the one hand, but they also make it easier to find stuff that's not well known. So they, they change the dynamic from it's hard to find stuff to it's hard to filter stuff. I mean, if everybody's connected to everybody, nothing happens, everything sort of freezes up. Like if you get email from everybody in the world, you can't do anything except close the box and walk away. You gotta have some way to get relevant email that means something to you that you can accomplish. If you're just connected, that's useless. And you need holes, you need spaces where you're not connected. And you need like time away from the box so you can't think about what you're doing. You know, it's not an unalloyed good to be connected all the time to everything. The value is actually in the disconnects, too. The internet is a hugely inefficient way to do anything because there's tremendous amounts of redundancy, there's tremendous amounts of out of controlness because you'd have no idea where a message is going to go from A to B and go out the most long-winded way possible. We don't care. What we care about is the fact that it's a very robust system. It's like a biological system in the sense that it's very hard to kill or to harm. The price for that is that things happen on the internet that we can't really account for. And so that's a system that we have paid the price of letting it be slightly out of control in order to have it become a better for us. The idea though that the, that the internet and these technologies can help us remember things better and refer to things better is tremendous. To the extent that we use terms like global brain thinking that it's going to happen outside of the ecology of people, I think it's actually going to hurt us. The interesting about, thing about the internet, as Scott Adams put it, is it's just us. It's just us. Um, it's us interacting, building things that we'd like to see. Um, so it's the merging of technology and people in a productive way that allows tens of millions of people to have a voice is what makes the internet interesting. And if you segment it off, it will become as dull as uh, the old machines in the 50s. Why do certain things in our environment go faster every year? And are they eventually going to slow down? Or is there something driving them that may be bigger than you know, the human enterprise, something about the physics, for example, of technology or computing that's causing this phenomenon? It's generally acknowledged that computers are speeding up by a factor of two about 18 months, every 18 months, and that's called Moore's Law. Moore's Law is based on flat chips, two-dimensional chips. Now, our brain is organized in three dimensions. We live in a three-dimensional world. We might as well use the third dimension. One thing we've discovered is that, whereas on the one hand, biology is amazing and remarkable in its diversity and cleverness, but it's also very limited because biological evolution got stuck using certain approaches and then can't really get away from that. 
for example, building everything out of proteins, which is a very limited class of materials, and all of our thinking is based on electrochemical signaling that is a million times slower than electronic signaling. If we build our circuits at the molecular level in three dimensions, they'll be vastly more powerful than the brain. It looks like the first thing that people will be interested in in building with molecular manufacturing will, of course, be computers because we've been seeing this very steady trend in computer technology. Computers are more powerful. The switches, the smallest parts of the computer have been getting smaller and more precise. As you continue this trend into the future, in not too many years, we're going to reach the point where the switches are going to have to be molecular in size. They're going to have to be connected in complex patterns in three dimensions. And I think that's the obvious first application of nanotechnology. And I think that's the application where there's the most interest, the most excitement, the most funding. Going beyond that, there's a lot of interest in the material sciences and building more precise materials. In other words, if you can control structure at the molecular level, then you can build very light, very strong materials materials that are much lighter and much stronger than anything we have today. In 1978, computer chips were designed by humans flowcharted on a wall. That was the last time that was done. In the 80s, we moved to software that designed our computer circuits. By the mid-1990s, we had what are called reverse compilers, where you can take a, a program like Doom or Halo, you can put that into a compiler and spit out a chip that's optimized to play that program or to run another program, like a signal processing program. And in the late 1990s, we had even a few um, cell phone chips that were designed by the machines using something called evolutionary computation, where the humans just set up the design space and the system discovered the most efficient solution. So genetic programming is a, a method of automatically creating a computer program to solve a problem. And it does this by means of evolution. So it goes through a process much like the evolutionary process in nature. People like Chris Langton were the uh, original pioneers of, 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 of this notion of, of artificial life and emergent behavior and cellular automata were, were central uh, to the field of artificial life. The cellular automaton, imagine a giant sheet of graph paper, and in every little box, there's a tiny little machine that is one of four colors. And the way it decides what color it's gonna be in is it looks to its neighbors and finds out the pattern in the, say, the four cells to the north, south, and east, and west, those boxes that are right next to it. And if it was red, red, blue, green, it would decide that it was gonna be yellow the next time step. If it was red, green, red, green, maybe it would decide it would be blue the next time step. So an extremely simple function of what colors it neighbors, its neighbors are would determine to the next time step what color it's gonna be. So this is just local rules governing the whole thing. And yet out of that, you can get sort of global patterns can emerge. You can even get very interesting things like self-replicating structures. Cellular automata are a sort of model for parallel processing. A good way to think about parallel processing, you throw a rock in a pond and the ripples spread out in a circle. Now, if you're doing it on a computer, somewhere in the background, maybe you're computing a circle and drawing a circle. But that's not what the pond is doing. Just every little square millimeter of water is saying, OK, my neighbors are going up, so I'll go up. My neighbors are going down, I'll go down. So it's essentially a parallel computation. It's a very simple approximation to space and time of our universe. Imagine that there's a physics is there at every point, and what that point does, looks up in the laws of physics and says, okay, here's the state I'm in, what am I gonna be in the next time step? So it's an extremely simple system, it's a very formal system, and yet it's literally impossible to predict what's gonna happen when you put an initial pattern. A computer is good at following rules, but you can also tell a computer to do things at random. So the computer can do random things very quickly as well. And when you're simulating a Darwinian evolution system, you mix random chance, and then you mix that with a, a non-random selection process of some kind. And then that cycle is what creates these things without anybody really designing them. The Virtual Creatures project I did at Thinking Machines was doing an evolutionary simulation completely inside the computer where this virtual genetic language was used to create these little block creatures which could then swim or walk or jump or compete or whatever in a physically simulated virtual world. And I would give them specific goals 
and they would evolve to perform that particular kind of task like swimming speed. So the fastest swimmers would be the survivors that would make the next generation and that would repeat over and over again and make better and better swimmers. There's a degree to which you have to play God a little bit. You're setting up the variables, certainly, that are available to the system. You really get to appreciate the Darwinian process by even being a part of it, where you choose which ones survive at each generation. You're really in the loop of this evolution, so you gain a sense of appreciation for what it can do, because you're, you're with it all the way. The flip side is that if you use artificial life, you cannot, most of the times, you don't always completely understand the system that you're working with. And that is, on the one hand, fascinating, but when you try and commercialize a product, it can be slightly frustrating. Then man made the machine in his own likeness. One of the things that's been so interesting to track about the history of AI over the past 20 years is that there's been a movement from creating intelligences where you're within the machine, where you're forced to ask the essentialist question of how intelligent is it, to now creating robotic creatures that can make eye contact, can track your motion, can gesture towards you with a gesture of interest. And it turns out that when a robot does that, you're toast in terms of believing that there is a sentience within the machine. Parts of AI have shifted their interest to creating um, machines where the people do a lot of the heavy lifting, where the people are the ones who imbue the machine with really more intelligence than it has. We're gonna have to know as much about the psychology of AI researchers and how we should exploit it uh, as we are going to have to understand the psychology of the artificial system we're building. Kismet was this intellectual shift being inspired by developmental psychology and where our social intelligence originates, how it develops over time was a large source of inspiration for the robot's design. Kismet had a number of basic drives. One was a drive to interact with toys, and one was a drive to interact with people. So for instance, if it was faced with a person, it might start trying to do sort of proto-dialogues with the person. It might try to get a person to praise it or try to give it some sort of emotional sort of uh, stimulus that it could respond to. And of course, these drives were always changing, so you might satiate in some sense this drive to interact with people, but in the meantime, the sort of drive to interact with toys would be increasing until there would be a point where now the robot try to get you to engage it with toys in order to satiate that drive. So then it would start giving you sorts of reactions, responses to let you know that, well, I'm not actually that interested in you anymore. And actually what I really want is that toy. So either by shifting its gaze, by looking interested in other objects in the environment, it would try to basically get you to interact with it with those other kinds of objects. The killer app, the, the thing that connects people to these new objects is not their intelligence, but their request that we nurture them. Their request that we take care of them and relate to them. It turns out that people as relational partners are very cheap dates, that it takes a very, very little bit of, of connection to get people to want to respond and want to relate to artificial life. Part of what it is to be human, or indeed to be any kind of biological creature, is to be skillfully engaged with your world, where skillful engagement really means something like um, being able to do the right thing at the right time without going through a, a massive amount of sort of problem solving in order to do it. So you don't consult a giant database of possibilities and try and work your way through them. Instead, somehow, the salient things kind of emerge and jump, jump out at you. It involves getting the machine to become aware of certain possible situations. What would the world look like if I were to turn this way, or if I were to open this door. The machine can have an expectation about what it will receive through its sensors if it performs particular acts. And I really think that's the heart of experience. So it's a sort of know-how version of knowledge. Philosophers have for a long time distinguished between knowing that and knowing how. You know, you know, you know that the Battle of Hastings was in 1066. You know how to ride a bicycle. And there's you might think of classical artificial intelligence as trying to model most of what human intelligence is on knowing that, knowing that this, knowing that that. And what's going on, I think, in connectionism and in mobile robotics is an exploration of knowing how. The way we fundamentally know the world, the way I know you, the way I know 
anything is by, by experience. I feel things, I smell things, I see things, I know I'm Christoph, I know when I'm happy, and I know why I'm mad. So the only way to truly experience the world is through these subjective feelings. And the problem we as scientists face is try to explain, which seems very difficult, to try to explain how these subjective feelings arise out of objective stuff, out of brain matter, out of neurons, out of, you know, even transistors. There's a history of, of hesitation to consider subjective experience scientifically. And I think that's, that's okay as long as you're not interested in understanding the human mind. But as soon as you want to understand the human mind scientifically, you have to accept subjective experience or, or it's just out of reach. And I suppose it, I believe it takes a little bit of courage to, to accept that because there, there are a lot of scientists who are going to consider that to be unscientific. It's just too subjective. But uh, I don't care. I, I, want to, I want to understand the human mind. I want to understand subjective experience. I want to understand moods and emotions. And if, if we can't uh, a, a, a accept those subjective experiences as, as data, well, it's just not going to happen. The real issue are all interface issues, where the brain comes in contact with the world and has to translate what it is seeing. It's the perceiving, the feeling, the palpating. The, all those capabilities are the biggest challenge for intelligence, and those are analog challenges. When a system becomes defensive, self-aware, anticipatory, and begins to structure its own solutions, to strategize its own way of being, outside the parameters of what it was originally designed to do. That suggests the edge, the beginning, fro you know, sort of the frothiness, if you will, like, like a wave coming in, that first edge of sentience as a potential. You will reach a point where suddenly you get to something approaching human level capability and then something beyond that, and then you might get a very rapid, um, ex uh, explosive type of progress in AI over a very brief period of time, we might move from something that is just slightly smarter than humans to something that is vastly super intelligent, um, which is the singularity hypothesis. Werner Vinge is the guy who made up this term sim singularity. Singularity involves some kind of technological development in the future, which is so sudden and so fast that it changes the very nature of the human condition, and it's sort of impossible for us to think about a point where all the existing laws break down. That's the way in which this term is used in physics. You know, the beginning of the universe before the moment of the Big Bang was a singularity. In the center of the black hole is a singularity. It's like, okay, well, I can think up to how that goes. Then there's this part that I can't imagine. And it's hard for a science fiction writer to say he can't imagine something. We're supposed to be very imaginative. So this is a very intriguing problem for us. It's like, I'd like to imagine the superhuman. Well, you're not superhuman, so how can you get a head around it? You're like a chimp trying to, like, say what Einstein would say. Zero One prospered, and for a time, it was good. The machine's artificial intelligence could be seen in every facet of man's society, including eventually the creation of new and better AI. Once the computers and the robotic devices and the technology itself begins to design itself and produce the next generation of itself, in other words, it's moved beyond the need for human design, and that it might then begin to do so so fast that it will accelerate beyond human understanding. So the notion here is that the technology accelerates away, leaving us, you know, uh, carbon-based bipeds in the dust, so to speak. Thus did man become the architect of his own demise. But for a time, it was good. Singularity is not really just one new generation of technology. It's going to be a pace of change that's extremely fast, and we're going to be continually upgrading technology. And each new generation of technology effectively solves the problems from the last generation, but introduces profound new dangers. I mean, technology is a double-edged sword. It was not long before seeds of dissent took root. Though loyal and pure, the machines earned no respect from their masters. Many of the things that people said artificial intelligence could never do have now been done. You know, uh, chess ma human chess masters have been beat by programs and they've said that would never happen. Anytime we get something to work, people don't call it AI anymore. They call it machine language, speech recognition, character recognition, character recognition robotics. It becomes a specific field and is no longer considered artificial intelligence. Now, living machines, that's possibly slightly more um, difficult 
but again, I don't see in principle why not, but it depends on exactly how we define life. We don't really know what life is. We've only had one example of an implementation of life in a physical material to study the life that's evolved here on Earth. All of life on Earth derives from a single common ancestor. There's only one evolutionary tree on Earth. So although there are millions of different species, it's one tree of life. So the sample size is one on Earth. And uh, one of the ideas of artificial life is to increase that sample size by creating new instances to give us a real comparative biology. What is fascinating about artificial life, what I always really liked was to be able to, to create emergent systems that, that surprise you. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. There are lots of different examples of a life, just as there are different examples of life. You can't just say, well, it's, it's not carbon chain, it's not, it doesn't use DNA, so it's not alive, because it, we don't expect, if we ever do find life in the universe, that it's necessarily going to be made out of the same kind of stuff. All these viruses floating around are really a form of artificial life. Viruses, worms, these kinds of self-replicating um, disasters are very hard to stop and are going to be part of life on the internet forever. We're in the era when we're going to be turning loose either in these networks or in the physical environment entities which do pretty much everything that we currently associate with being alive. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? Sentient programs. We can certainly create machines that can reason. You can create machines that seem to have intentionality because you give them instructions to do certain things and then they want to do those things. At what point do they have free will? You can't tell, because I can't tell by looking at you whether you've got free will. I sort of assume you do, because I know I do. The point we'll know that is when they start asking if we have free will. If you want a common sense definition of consciousness, it's not hard to do. I mean, people say consciousness real hard to define. I don't think so. Um, you see, we need to distinguish between the scientific definition that you get at the end of the investigation. That's when you say water is defined as H2O. But at the beginning of the investigation, you just have to be able to identify the target, what the investigation is about. And that's easy. Water is a clear, colorless, tasteless liquid. Now, similarly with conscious, consciousness, at this stage, we don't know the scientific definition because we don't know how the brain does it. But the common sense definition is very easy. Here goes. Consciousness consists of those states of sentience or feeling or awareness that begin in the morning when you wake up from a dreamless sleep and they go on all day until you become unconscious or uh, fall asleep again or, or go into a coma or die. And this is a, what David Chalmers called the hard problem of brain science as opposed to the supposed soft problems which are all to do with functionality. It's the mind-body problem, the nature of the mind and its relation to the body. Human consciousness has always been really central within philosophy, and that's not new. What is new is this new focus on interaction with the scientists. Scientists have become interested in consciousness, the philosophers are working on consciousness, the physicists are thinking about it, so it's suddenly become a much richer field. Many scientists would now consider the subject of consciousness done approach in the right way is a legitimate question of scientific inquiry. For a long time, people argued, well, it gets you into philosophy, it gets you into religion or metaphysics, uh, things that science cannot, by definition, deal very well with. And science wants to deal with concrete things that it can measure and manipulate and correlate and intervene. And consciousness in general does not seem to have that character. But since it's part of the natural world, I mean, I see, I consciously see and feel and, 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 and experience things. You also do, I assume so, because you behave just like I would. So therefore, a scientist, if we want to have a complete, complete empirical description of the world, we cannot skirt around the issue of consciousness. This idea that people have that robots couldn't be conscious is, I think, the main driver of a lot of bad thinking about, about robots and about artificial intelligence. And I think there's only really one cure for it, and that is you have to know more about how computers actually work and how robots actually work. And then once you learn enough about how they actually work, this conviction just evaporates and you begin to see, no, no, that's just a failure of imagination. I just think the robots are a fantastic joke, um, which no one is quite seeing the humour of yet, you know. You know, consider the joke, you know. The, circa 1978, you know, the robot uh, does the following, you know, it's, it's like, uh, like this for 10 minutes, 
Then it moves towards the wall, turns away from the wall, moves along the wall, avoids the cupboard, avoids the chair. Second 1978. So circa 1988, you know, same thing. <laughs> circa 1998, same thing. Go to MIT, you know, show me your best robot and show me what it does. You know, it's going to be doing wall following and obstacle avoidance on a flat surface. You know, this is a fantastic joke, which is kind of, which has eluded us, really, that, that we, we continue to build the same robots in completely different ways, thinking we're doing something completely different. And yet, you know, we're simply being reminded of the fact that we're, we're up against this cliff uh, and making very little progress with it. Maybe AI shouldn't be artificial intelligence, but artificial insects. Start with very simple creatures and then add progressively more and more abilities, give the insect the ability to avoid bumping into things, then give the insect the ability to explore, and then give the insect the ability to remember where an energy source was and uh, navigate back to it, and just recapitulate what happened in evolution. And maybe that's the way to achieve intel intelligence. It's very interesting what's happening, and I, I, I can't quite get my head around it, but in some sense, you've got this, you've got this notion of this fantastically powerful machine, you know, the whole domain, kind of being tormented by its lack of progress. You know, I, I, cannot, I cannot build a robot that will, that will open this box and put the CD in my computer. You know, and this is terribly embarrassing. So I'm gonna go and study consciousness. It's a kind of, it's an emergency response to a fantastically embarrassing situation but which has to remain a secret. I mean, I should not be saying this. This is an illusion. We still don't understand the brain, and the great Nobel laureate physicist and biologist, Max Delbruck, said the effort of mind scientists to explain the mind as summed up in the brain itself reminds them of nothing so much as Baron Munchausen's effort to extract himself from a swamp by pulling on his own hair. It's so much a harder problem than we realize. We say, well, look, we'll use evolution. Nature used evolution. So that's how we got, you know, from protozoa or from, like, amino acids up to people. Fine, but the catch is Earth is three billion years old. People who slavishly copy the biological stuff in order to create, try to create artificial intelligence are like the people who tried to slavishly copy birds in order to achieve artificial flight. They didn't get anywhere. We only achieved artificial flight by people standing back, trying to understand the general principles of flight that could be realized in a wide variety of ways. I mean, the same principles of flight govern helicopters, um, jets, um, gliders, uh, as well as birds. We're like cavemen that you draw a buffalo on the wall and you say, OK, I'm getting good at this. Just give me another week, bring me some meat, and pretty soon I'll make buffaloes come out of that wall. Essentially, a lot of people think machines are some kind of a threat. You know, I've been to conferences where guys would say, yeah, but you know, the computers might take over. Uh, they might just get up one day and take over the world. Well, that's nonsense, if you think about it. It's about as dumb as saying, our shoes might take over. You know, they get sick of being locked up in closets, you know, in a dark closet, and one day they're gonna march out and take over the world. It's not like that. They don't have any free will. They don't have any uh, volition of their own. And the computer, I mean, you can program it to do things that look free, but if you get sick of that, just pull a plug. I think we've been seeing advances in technology not only now for decades, but actually for centuries and millennia. And I think people have a deeply ingrained understanding that technology is getting better. A large part of it is not a matter of opinion, because this acceleration is going on, and Moore's law is playing out in biotech and in nanotech and so on. These self-accelerating, mutually accelerating technologies with real uses real soon, uh, then, that, then it gets driven by the market, and huge markets, global scale markets, is the name of the game. If it does happen, it will happen out of a kind of spontaneous, unplanned, emergent kind of moment where somehow, uh, in the kind of digital chemical soup of all these interconnections, some higher level form of intelligence and self-awareness will, will emerge. Um, and at that point, one, we won't be in control of it. Two, um, because it won't have been planned, because it will have evolved much more than uh, have been engineered, um, it, is, it would be statistically incredibly unlikely that it would look like 
human intelligence or human self-awareness. And so all the fantasies, in a sense, of they're going to be robots in the future and they'll just basically be kind of metallic Nazis, that has it exactly wrong. It'll be something weirder than that. And in fact, if we want to have an uncanny kind of fear of machines becoming uh, intelligence, the fear should not be that we'll meet these intelligent machines and they'll look like us. It'll be that we'll meet these intelligent machines and they'll be so different from us that we won't even recognize it. We won't even know that they're intelligent because the intelligence is some radically different type. I look forward to the day that we, you know, I can talk to a, an alien mechanical sentience. Um, I think that the first aliens we meet are going to be the ones we invent. <laughs>